very good morning, beloved in the Lord. I trust that you are all well. And I also invite you to be part and parcel of our month of August. We journey with women in terms of gender-based violence. And we trust that God will guide us and God will lead us to a point of reflection and a point of conviction in terms of this violation. God bless you. And I call upon Sister Phyllis Several to do the opening prayer for us, please. Heavenly Father, I come to you this morning and I bring all women to you at this time of uncertainty. I pray for women to have a finely tuned ear for the voice of the Holy Spirit so that when we walk, we would hear that voice whispering, this is the way, walk in it. And so we would walk forward unafraid. I pray that we would be women who celebrate other women. I pray that we would be a voice of truth and boldness. Friends, I pray that the right woman would come into your life at the right time. I pray that you will open, that you will be open to finding them. May you always be watching for hints of your people. I pray that you would be surrounded by women who know what it is to love and champion and to celebrate other women. I pray for the spiritual, for the spiritual midwives in your lives. Women who would breathe alongside of you as you are giving birth to the new you over and over again. May we be alongside of women who invite us to go deeper, who make us more real, more honest, who know who we are without makeup or masks. May we learn and challenge and grow. May we reclaim curiosity and wisdom and knowledge. May we find good leaders to follow. Good leaders who will influence us, call us out, mentor us, coach us, teach us, challenge us, push us. Lord, we call out to the sins of violence, rape, abuse, torture against all women. No more. May we be a woman who is safe, a woman who does not fear, a woman who builds safety and security for other women too. Heavenly Father, we call out the economic injustices, the forced prostitution, the sex trafficking, and all of the countless ways that the image of God in a woman is abused and mistreated and broken or diminished. We call it out and name it for what it is. Sin, powers, principalities, systemic evil, injustice, and we cast it down in the name of Jesus. I pray that you will continue casting it down with your whole life. I pray for healing sisters and I pray for your wholeness. I pray for your boldness. I pray for your voice to rise. May you witness a new thing brewing and may your very place of death become a story of unexpected resurrection. Amen. Greetings brothers and sisters in the name of our Lord and Saviour Jesus Christ. Welcome to the pilot service of our Women's Month celebrations. We light this candle this day. In honor of all women, not only in our country, but also over, all over the world. The colors depicted on the altar and the candle have a profound and special meaning. Please allow me to share the reasons for this with you. The yellow is the color for healing physically and spiritually, restoration, independence, and overcoming great odds and challenges. Most of all, the color yellow means victory. The color lilac is for memoriam. Many of our sisters have been called to higher services, to higher service since August last year. Every woman lost to us is a part of who we really are. They have made an impact in our lives and left an indelible mark on all our lives as women. Give thanks to God for the women in our families and our communities and our churches in the UCCSA who have diligently and sincerely run the race all their lives, pleasing, honoring and worshiping God. Our matriarch, the Reverend Margaret Constable, who all her life championed our cause in the women's ministry. Her faith, her work, her witness and her worship 
Praise be to God for such a warrior, fully clad in the armour of God. Gracious lady, kind, wholesome, truthful and living, and loving to serve everyone. May she rest safely in the arms of Jesus. Herewith we wish all the ladies a blessed and peaceful rest to all our departed and loved sisters in the UCCSA. The colour green. It's life. It means life. Glorious, gorgeous, beautiful life. Genesis. Imagine in the book of Genesis when they explained how God created the earth and everything that was in it and it was all beautiful and pleasing to him. Imagine all the colours of green. May our women never be sidetracked by our circumstances. Life, however, is difficult. Every form of adversity depends on how we see it. Look backward. Look to Genesis. Our relationship with God and Jesus Christ and the Holy Spirit determines the cause of our lives. Live life to the full, my sisters. Live it with hope and faith and love. Live and live, my sisters. Just truly live. Live your life to the fullest with Jesus Christ. Simply just live. And so with us, we wish you a blessed and victorious Women's Month to all of you, everywhere, wherever you are. In Jesus' name, Amen. Our scripture reading for today is found in the book of Genesis chapter 16, Hagar and Ishmael. Abram's wife Sarai had not borne him any children, but she had an Egyptian slave woman named Hagar, and so she said to Abram, The Lord has kept me from having children. Why don't you sleep with my slave? Perhaps she can have a child for me. Abram agreed with what Sarai said, so she gave Hagar to him to be his concubine. This happened after Abram had lived in Canaan for ten years. Abram and had intercourse with Hagar, and she became pregnant. When she found out that she was pregnant, she became proud and despised Sarai. Then Sarai said to Abram, It's your fault that Hagar despises me. I myself gave her to you, and ever since she found out that she was pregnant, she has despised me. May the Lord judge which of us is right, you or me. Abram answered, Very well, she is your slave and under your control. Do whatever you want with her. Then Sarah treated Hagar so cruelly that she ran away. The angel of the Lord met Hagar at a spring in the desert on the road to Shur and said, Hagar, slave of Sarah, where have you come from and where are you going? She answered, I am running away from my mistress. He said, go back to her and be her slave. Then he said, I will give you so many descendants that no one will be able to count them. You are going to have a son and you will name him Ishmael because the Lord has heard your cry of distress. But your son will live like a wild donkey. He will be against everyone and everyone will be against him. He will live apart from all his relatives. Hagar asked herself, Have I really seen God and lived to tell about it? So she called the Lord who had spoken to her, a God who sees. That is why people call her the well between Kadesh and Berad, the well of the living one who sees me. Hagar bore Abram a son, and he named him Ishmael. Abram was 86 years old at that time. This is the word of God. Thanks be to God. Beloved, our uh, beloved sister, Marian Raleigh will now give us a synopsis of the scripture read by uh, Mrs. Holland. Hagar, 
a victim or upwardly mobile. Hagar was an Egyptian girl who was a slave in the household of Sarah, a Hebrew princess. Sarah may have acquired Hagar as part of the generous bride price paid to her by her husband Abraham by Pharaoh in Egypt. This story is recorded in Genesis 12. Ancient wall painting of a beautiful Egyptian woman. A human being as a, as a wedding gift, it seems strange to us, but it was an accepted practice at the time to give servants and slaves as a part of the dowry of a wealthy young woman. If Hagar was a gift from Pharaoh, she was probably an accomplished servant with valuable skills, and becoming the servant of a nomadic tribeswoman may have been a step down for her socially and her stage. Hagar was always disadvantaged among the Hebrew women because she was a foreigner and she was also a slave. This was ironic since she came from a land that was socially and politically advanced and possessed cities, temples and elaborate burial sites. Hagar must have found the living conditions of the Hebrew, Hebrew people quite primitive by comparison to where she came from. It seems that Hagar's new owner, Sarah, could not conceive a child, which was, after all, the primary function of a bridal leader's wife. In her own eyes, and in the estimation of a tribe, she was a failure, and her barren state was a constant torment to her. She decided then to offer her slave Hagar to Abram as a surrogate. Hagar would bear the child and look after it, but it would belong to Sarah, and be accepted as the child of Sarah and Abraham. To modern people, the idea of giving another woman to your husband to bear a child seems the strangest thing, and also brutal. But in ancient Near Eastern family law, it was the practice that was common and acceptable. What did Hagar think of this? Hagar consulted in the matter, we don't know. People at the time assumed that she would leap at the opportunity. Why? Because for a woman in Hagar's position, the prospect of becoming pregnant to the leader of the clan was an honor and would result in a dramatic rise in her social status. She would become an important concubine or secondary wife and no longer a slave, definitely a step up in the world. Eventually, she would be the mother of the tribe's leader which would make her queen bee of all the tribe. Sarah's plan for Hagar backfires. Genesis 16 verses 1 to 6. Something went wrong between Hagar and Sarah after Hagar became pregnant. Sarah was daily confronted by the woman, by the woman's success at conceiving a child. And she believed that Hagar no longer gave her the de deference that she deserved as master or mistress. For her part, Hagar may have enjoyed being treated with respect for the first time in her life and did not bother to hide her pleasure. Sarah berated Abraham for what had happened. It was all his fault, she said. Abraham pointed out quite rightly that it was not in his power to do anything to the situation since Sarah was still in charge of the woman of the tribe. And Hagar was under her jurisdiction and not his. This gives us some inkling to the proper property rights and social power of the woman who led the tribe at that time. She, not her husband, ruled the other tribal women and was responsible for all of them. Sarah humbly and unjustly punishes Hagar. In response to Abram's words, Sarah humbly humbled Hagar and the narrator ironically uses the same word that describes the treatment of Hebrew slaves in Egypt at the time of Moses. Sarah humbled an Egyptian as the Egyptians would one day humble Sarah's descendants. What this humbling entailed, we do not know. 
but it was, a, was so severe enough to drive Hagar away, fleeing from the relative safety of the tribe out into the bleak landscape and into the desert. Pregnant, she headed out in such desperation and made an attempt to get back to her lost home and her family in Egypt. Hagar tries to go home. She followed the road to Shur, which was one of the trade routes passing through the Sinai Peninsula. Alone and unaided, it was a heroic effort and a tribute to her tenancy that she got as far as she did. The country was fearsome, eroded hills like bare bones in an arid landscape, the earth tormented by constant and vicious winds. Despite this, Hagar very nearly made it to Egypt, but eventually she stopped at the spring of water in the wilderness of Shur. At this moment, an angel spoke to her, telling her to return to Sarah and to have her baby among the Hebrews. It would be a special child, a child with a great future. So she retraced her steps and returned to the tribe and went back to Sarah. Hagar and Ishmael were expelled. Genesis 21 verses 1 to 21. Despite Hagar's return, the rivalry between the two women was unresolved. It got even worse. The birth of Sarah's son Isaac, Genesis 21 verses 1 to 7, set up the balance of power and the problem resurfaced again. The situation was not uncommon, uncommon in societies that practice polygamy. The Old Testament recognized the positions of love of the loved wife and disliked wife, and there were specific laws about the inheritance due to children of both. This we find recorded in Deuteronomy 21, 15 to 17. You might read also Samuel 1 verses 1 to 7. For the story of the relationship between Hannah and the beloved childless wife and Penina, the less loved and fer but fertile wife, both married to the prophet Elkanah. Their story echoed the situation that existed between Hagar and Sarah. Abraham expels Hagar and her son Ishmael. For 14 years, Ishmael was seen as the future heir of Abraham. He and Hagar were accustomed to being treated with respect. But when Sarah had her own son, everything changed. The question was, who would be Abraham's heir? The firstborn son of the principal wife or the surrogate wife? This was the question that would surface continually to plague Israel throughout its history. Sarah had no doubt about the matter. She saw Ishmael as a threat to her son and the old enmity between the two women reappeared, now even more savage than it had ever been before. One telling detail was that Sarah never speaks directly to Hagar or says her name, never once in the whole story. The child grew and was weaned, and Abraham made a great feast on the day that Isaac was weaned. But Sarah saw the son of Hagar the Egyptian, whom she had borne to Abram, playing with her son Isaac. So she said to Abraham, Cast out this slave woman with her son, for the son of this slave woman shall not inherit it along with, be inherited along with my son Isaac. This we read in Genesis 21, 8 to 14. The rich fabric of Sarah's gown and the voluptuous red of Hagar's says it all. Sarah has power and wealth. Hagar has youth, sexual allure, and an unborn, unborn child. Sarah drives her away like a stray dog that has overstayed its welcome. Read the Bible, read the story, read about what happened to Hagar. Blessed be the name of the Lord for this. Amen. I am a flyer. You find me by water, lonely and tired.
lost and afraid I am a stranger The means of a master Soon to be mother In desolate plains You're the one who sees me You see me Hear me in my misery You're the one who sees You're the one who saves me You save me Even when I'm wondering You're the one who saves We become wanderers the loss of a father Sun's getting hotter The waters run dry Broken, unstable Done all that I'm able Tears draw a Shout to the sky You're the one who sees me You see me Hear me in my misery You're the one who sees You're the one who says Beloved, thank you for joining us and we trust that you will reflect on the story of Hagar and God will guide us in terms of breaking the silence if we happen to be in the same situation. Let's receive the benediction. And now may the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with us now to all eternity. Amen.